excited to have you. I'm excited to have you here. Uh, we're looking at the book of Judges tonight. We are looking at Judges, and I hope you have a Bible with you. I hope you're ready to, to take a look and see uh, some of the uh, exciting and also sordid details of the book of Judges. Now, if you're watching live, get, please feel free. Give us a shout out. I've got one right here. I'm so glad that John and Nelda are tuning in tonight. Appreciate that very much. Several others. And we're going to be looking again at the book of Judges. We're going to spend a few minutes in this about 40 minute study. We're also going to look at the book of Ruth and um, surveying these two books together tonight. So thanks for tuning in. Uh, my name is Mark. I uh, want to remind you that I preach for the Parkway Church of Christ. That's the website for the church here in Corpus Christi, Texas. And if you're in the area, love for you to drop by, uh, visit with us. My website is holybiblestudy.com. Um, got some books there, including the one in the center of the screen right now, The Big Picture. If you're not familiar with it, it is a survey of the entire Bible. And we're basing our study on this book. However, I'll tell you, there, there's a lot of extra information that I'm presenting tonight that's not actually in, in the book. I've uh, got a couple of others here. Laverne, this is this is uh, another week in a row that you've been here, and, and I appreciate uh, John Rogers tuning in. So glad that you are here uh, participating in this live stream. Well, tonight we're going to be looking at Judges and the book of Ruth, just four chapters in Ruth, and we're going to be going quickly, as we always are in this survey of the Bible, the big picture. So let's make this observation first. The, the book of Judges is a series of uh, cycles, you might say, and uh, they're keyed by some statements that are made in the verses that you see on the screen there. So these, these um, verses are indicating that, um, that there's a, a structure to this book. And if that's something you're not familiar with, well, we're going to be looking at it tonight. And each time we go in this, this cycle, as it were, see, I'm making a circle there. Let, let me show you what I've got here. Uh, I don't know where I picked these up years ago, but I've got four R's, relapse, and then retribution, repentance, and then rescue. And then the cycle starts over. What, what, what does this mean? If you're not familiar with it, uh, let, let me let me point this out to you that the children of Israel, the nation has entered into Canaan. And that's what we saw in the book of Joshua. They, they've entered the land, but they have not completely subdued it. And there are a lot of uh, nations that are pagan and and practice idolatry and are evil, quite frankly. And they are influencing God's covenant people. So God will allow the surrounding nations to punish them, and that's, that's the relapse and retribution. Then the people cry out for a deliverer. We're so sorry, God. We're so sorry that we have uh, forsaken your covenant. And then God will send a rescuer, as they're called in, in the book, the judges, and these aren't, of course, these aren't people that are sitting in a court of law with robe, black robes. Rather, these are very often military leaders. They're, they're people who have been selected by God to deliver his people. And it's not necessarily the entire nation all at one time. Really, they're not a nation right now. They're, they're 12 tribes inhabiting a land, and they will coalesce under the leadership of, of Saul. And that we'll look at that next week. But right now, they're, they're, they're tribes who are sometimes faithful to God, and, and in the book of Judges, very often, more often than not, they are not uh, faithful to God. I've got my father tuning in as well. Thank you so much. Glad that you all are, are tuning in. So I know I'm talking to an audience right now of people who are very familiar with Judges. There are also others who, who aren't as familiar with it. I hope this will be a good review and a, and a good introduction to the exciting book of Judges. So let, let's think about how these relate to our study. 
in, uh, in Judges 2, verse 11, for example, you've got uh, Israel uh, relapsing into sin. The people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. That's the recurring phrase that you see over and over again. And then it says that the Lord abandoned or was abandoned by them. And then he allowed them to be subdued. And so it says in verse 14 of Judges 2, so the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. He gave them over to plunderers. And then in, in verse 16, it says, then the Lord raised up judges. These are military leaders who were going to save them out of the hand of those who plundered them. That's Judges 2, verse 16. The first judge is Othniel. And so in, uh, in chapter 3, verse 7, it says, The people of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. They forgot the Lord their God and served the Baals and the Ashtaroth. Therefore, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. And so he allows them to be oppressed for eight years. Verse 9, the people of Israel cried out to the Lord. That's the repentance part of this. And then God sends them a judge. Verse 12 has the, the uh, judgeship of Ehud, and it starts out the same exact way. And the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And then the Lord's angry with his people when they are oppressed they cry out to God, and then he sends them a judge. He sends them Ehud over and over and over again. Hi, Maggie. Glad that you're here with us tonight. Thanks so much for tuning in. Glad you're feeling well enough to do that. Chapter 4, verse 1. And the people again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord after Ehud died. Chapter 6, verse 1. Chapter 10, verse 6. Chapter 13, verse 1. These are the cycles that occur again and again and again. Now, what's really interesting about the book of Judges is that each time they go through a cycle, there, there's another dimension to it. They begin to sag deeper and deeper into sin as a nation. And, and what's particularly amazing about Judges, I mean, all the Bible uh, is, is applicable to us. But right now in our society today, it seems like we are living in the dark days of sin within our nation. And I, I, I don't ever, I didn't want to become uh, that, that, uh, that cliche of, of the older guy who says, back in my day, everything was so great and wonderful. And, and yet right now in our day and time, it's, it's pretty bad. Uh, we're dealing with a lot of uh, really really difficult moral issues in our country. And, and I think we're going to be able to relate somewhat to what we're seeing in the book of Judges, where people are becoming less and less aware of God and more and more focused on sin. And so in Judges 13, verse 1, as the story of Samson is about to begin, uh, the last judge talked about in the book of Judges, the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. Uh, let me introduce you to the judges. They start out great. You've got this man named Othniel, and he is a, a wonderful uh, person. Uh, Ehud, uh, he, um, he's got a, a flaw about him. And, uh, and then Deborah, you know what's wrong with Deborah as a judge? She's a woman. Gideon is fearful. And yet God chooses him to be a judge. Jephthah makes a rash vow. And I'm assuming most of us are very familiar with the story of Samson, probably the most famous of the judges. And he is a worldly reprobate. So these are God's leaders. And you start it with Othniel. He's great. He's, he's awesome. But then they become progressively worse. And I, I think Othniel, Ehud, Deborah, I think, I think they're fine. Gideon is kind of the turning point, but uh, Ehud um, is left-handed. That's his flaw. <laughs> you know how people are so um, suspicious of left-handed people. And that's part of the superstition that goes back centuries, I guess millennia. Deborah's a woman. Gideon scared to death. And yet God has called him to be a judge. 
Uh, I've got several judges listed here, though, in italics. Shamgar, Tola, Jer, Ibzan, Elon, Abdon. Uh, we know hardly anything about these guys. The focus in the book of Judges are the names I've got in, in all caps. Othniel, Ehud, uh, Skip, Shamgar, Deborah, Gideon. Abimelech is Gideon's son, and Abimelech is not really a judge. He appoints himself. He wants to be king. And then you've got Jephthah, Samson, and then the book's sordid, horrible, awful epilogue. And we're not going to read the epilogue. But if you think about the book of Judges and how we kept seeing this phrase over and over again, the people did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. This is what's characteristic of the epilogue. Judges 17 verse 6 says, in those days, listen to this, in those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. And then the very last verse of Judges, Judges 21, verse 25, says the same exact thing. In, the, in those days, there was no king in Israel. Every man did what was right in his own eyes. That sets off the epilogue. Judges 17, uh, verse 6, and Judges 21, verse 25 are identical, characterizing the nation, not even having God in the picture. They're just doing what's evil. And, and I wonder if, if we're not there yet. If our nation isn't isn't becoming like this dark period in Israelite history, now fortunately there is going to be a, a new judge. The final judge is 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 recorded in the book of First Samuel, and his name is Samuel, and he is he is the judge, not a military judge, but but a spiritual leader. We're not going to be talking about First Samuel tonight. That's next week, but this evening we're going to walk through. We're going to survey the book of Judges. And so this is how we're going to do it. Well, it's going to be quick, but I'm hoping you're going to be able to understand how the book is laid out. And, and here's some things that are going to be intriguing to you and encourage you to read the book of Judges. So the first part of Judges, the prologue, uh, starts with the very first verse, of course, Judges 1, verse 1, through chapter 3, verse 6. And what we're going to see very quickly is that the Israelite nation was supposed to have driven out all the evil nations in Canaan. Under the leadership of Joshua, they go in, they start subduing the land, but they don't completely subdue it. Now, at the end of the book of Joshua, everything sounded great. So here's Joshua 21, verse 43. Thus the Lord gave to Israel all the land that he swore to give to their fathers. Listen to this. They took possession of it and they settled there. That's how the book of Joshua ends. Uh, Joshua gives his farewell address in, in chapters 23 and 24. As for me and for my house, we will serve the Lord. Joshua 24 verse 16, the people respond and say, yes, we will serve the Lord. But then they don't. Here is the very first verse of Judges, Judges 1, verse 1. After the death of Joshua, the people of Israel, well, it sounds good. Let, let's see what happens. They inquired of the Lord. That's good. Who shall go up first against us, uh, for us, against the Canaanites, to fight against them? All right, let's go subdue the land. Let's do this. And it, it maybe shouldn't be a surprise to us. It's Judah, the tribe of Judah, from whom will come David, the royal uh, lineage. The Lord said, Judah shall go up. Behold, I have given the land into his hand. Talking about the tribe, not the person. Judah is long since dead. He's talking about the tribe. And Judah, the tribe of Judah, said to Simeon, his brother, come up with me, and I likewise will go with you. So, Simeon, you fight for me, and, and I'll fight for you. And that makes sense, because the tribe of Simeon actually is enveloped inside of the tribe of Judah. Only tribe that happens to, there's a reason for that. But uh, Judah and Simeon start off the book of Judges fighting together. They're subduing the land. They're driving out the nations. This is going to be great. The conquest of, of Canaan. Here we go. 
Judah went up. And you see I've highlighted this term where they go up. They keep going up. Judah went up and the Lord gave the Canaanites and the Perizzites into their hand. And they defeated 10,000 of them at, at Bezek. All right. That's great. Uh, and then it continues. The descendants of the Kenite went up with the people of Judah. The house of Joseph, that's referring to the tribe of Ephraim and, and the tribe of Manasseh, also went up against Bethel. And the Lord was with them. We're, we're just in chapter one here. It's looking good, isn't it? This is verse 22. Let's go back to verses 19 and 21. Uh-oh talking about the tribe of Judah, they could not drive out the inhabitants of the plain Well, because they had chariots of iron. I mean, of course you can't drive them out because they have, they have these, these great war machines. The people of Benjamin did not drive out the Jebusites who lived in Jerusalem. And that's going to require David of the tribe of Judah to do. He's got to fix what the Benjaminites couldn't do and, and uh, this is actually looking toward uh, David. Uh, in fact, the Joshua, Judges, Ruth, the, they're all pointing to the tribe of Judah taking a leadership role, becoming the royal tribe. And uh, there's a lot going on uh, in, in that regard, in, in, even in the book of Judges, as well as in the book of Ruth. Uh, you keep going. And, and so you've got, you've got this excitement initially but it kind of fizzles out because, well, Manasseh, another of the tribes, did not drive out the inhabitants. Ephraim did not drive out the, the Canaanites. Zebulun did not drive out the inhabitants. Asher did not drive out. So Naphtali did not drive out. I mean, it's just not going as well as they had planned. And that's chapter one. This is all part of the introduction to the book of Judges. In chapter 2, an angel of the Lord went up, just like all them been going up, but he's going to go up and talk to the people. And what he has to say is not good. And he reminds them of the covenant that they swore to. They committed to the covenant. And, and God said, I will not ever break my covenant with you. Chapter 2, verse 2. You shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of this land. You shall break down their altars, but you have not obeyed my voice. What is this you have done? And so what God says in chapter two, verses one through five is, I'm not going to drive out these nations for you. That's part of what's going on here. They're, they're not being faithful to the Lord. They're not placing their trust in God. They're looking at these, these chariots of iron and going, oh no. And yet, and we didn't, we didn't look at this, but in the book of Joshua, some of their kings had chariots of, of iron, but Joshua overcame them. Why can't they do it now? Because they lack the faith. They lack confidence in God. And so the book of Joshua recorded the death of Joshua. It is, it is re-recorded in chapter 2, and the unfaithfulness of Israel is emphasized in these verses. Chapter 2, verse 11 the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals. Verse 16 of chapter 2, the Lord raises up judges. And so you've got this spiritual failure on the part of the people described until you get to Judges chapter 3, verse 7. And this is the good judge. This is, this is Othniel. And it's just a few verses here. Uh, but uh, I'll just pick out a couple. Verse 10, the spirit of the Lord was upon Othniel and he judged Israel. Well, this idea of judging isn't, again, uh, a judicial judging, judicial judging. It is setting things right. It is setting, uh, bringing, bringing uh, order to the chaos that is caused by sin. And, and these judges uh, are coming in. Uh, relieving the people of the oppression they are facing and bringing order, bringing peace to the region. But the people lapse in sin again. Chapter 3, verse 12. And the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. So Othniel is this great, great guy. Ehud is great too. And he has that one little flaw about him. And this is, this is fascinating. Uh, he's left-handed. Uh, let's read a little bit of this. This is Judges 3, verse 12. 
Uh, the people of Israel, again, did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord strengthened Eglon, the king of Moab, against Israel because they had done what was evil in the sight of the Lord. It's not God who's trying to be mean to his people, right? It's that his people are being unfaithful to him. And uh, the people of Israel served Eglon, the king of Moab, 18 years. So they have relapsed. Verse 15, then the people cried out to the Lord. I'm telling you, this pattern happened six times in the book of Judges. Uh, the people cry out to the Lord. The Lord raises up a deliverer, a judge, Ehud, uh, a Benjaminite, a left-handed man. You know, the Bible doesn't give us a lot of details about what people look like or physical characteristics. And when it does, it's important. And this is important. So what Ehud does in verse 16 is make himself a sword, a two-edged sword. And uh, he goes to the king of Eglon and, and uh, he, he pays tribute. Verse 17. And he presented the tribute to Eglon, king of Moab. Now, Eglon was a very fat man. There's another detail uh, about a man's appearance, not very favorable. In fact, this is rather humorous, uh, disgustingly humorous, what's about to happen. If you're not familiar with it, prepare yourself. When Ehud had finished presenting the tribute, he sent away the people who carried the tribute. So, so Ehud's now alone. Uh, and, and he's there with, with Eglon, the king, and his guards. He himself turned back at the idols near Gilgal and said, I have a secret message for you, O king. And of course, Eglon goes, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, it's a secret message. You know, he's excited about this. He's all right. He commanded silence, and all his attendants went out from his presence. So we got some drama going on here. Ehud came to him as he was sitting alone in his cool roof chamber. And Ehud says this again. He says, I have a message from God for you. And he arose from his seat. It's just Eglon and Ehud, just the two of them. Ehud reaches with his left hand, because he's left-handed, and takes the sword from his right thigh, and thrust it into his belly. Normally, the king would have probably known what was going on or had some sense of what was going on if uh, if, e e if Ehud had been right-handed and the sword had been on his left side. You know, he's, but it switched. And this becomes an advantage for Ehud. Now, we're not done yet. Verse 22, And the hilt also went in after the blade, and the fat closed over the blade, for he did not pull the sword out of his belly. Here's the ESV. The dung came out. Apparently, he uh, he has pierced him, pierced him on the inside, pierced his intense, intense intestines, and dung is has emerged. Ehud went out onto the porch. He, he, he gets out of there. The door's still locked. The guards are, are waiting until they're embarrassed. They go, well, I mean, what's taking so long? I mean, they can smell the stench, and they just assume Elon the king is relieving himself. And then they finally go in, they break open the door, and they see Elon with this sword, the hilt, all the way in his, in his belly, and he's dead. Wow. I mean, what do you think of that? This is a disgusting murder, assassination. And this is characteristic of the disgusting details you're going to find in the book of Judges. So if you aren't familiar with this, welcome to the book of Judges. Um, I think a lot of watching tonight probably are. If you're watching it after the fact, man, I, I'm so excited that you have found us and that you're watching this. Uh, Shamgar uh, is mentioned in verse 31, one verse to this, what we might call a minor judge, just because there's not much said about him. But he goes against the bitter enemy of the Israelites, the Philistines, with an ox goad. So that's kind of interesting. Uh, kills 600 Philistines with an ox goad. Judges 4 and 5 tell us about the next judge. So we've got a big story about 
Othniel, actually just a few verses. He's a good, good guy. Ehud, the longest so far. And, and then we've got chapters four and five all about Deborah. Now, here's the thing about Deborah. She's a woman, and yet she's the one who's judging Israel. Chapter four, verse one, the people of Israel, again, did what was evil in the sight of the Lord after Ehud died. And the Lord sold them into the hand of Jabin, king of Canaan. And then we're told the name of his commander, Sisera. And Sisera will play a prominent role here in chapter four. Well, uh, a man by the name of Barak goes to Deborah and she uh, convinces him to go fight against Sisera. And uh, and May Barak says, yeah, and, and Deborah is the judge. Deborah is the judge, not Barak, but Barak uh, fights against the bitter enemy of Israel here. Uh, Sisera is the commander of the king of Canaan, he's called, uh, Jabin. And Sisera is going to die in a very grotesque way. <laughs> um, mentioned in verse 12 is Mount Tabor. Mount Tabor. When Sisera was told that Barak, the son of Abinoam, had gone up to Mount Tabor, Sisera called out all his chariots. 900 chariots of iron. Here we go again with the chariots of iron. Oh, no. And all the men who were with him. Uh, and so they are going to go fight against Barak, uh, who was who was leading the army. Deborah is the judge. And, and one of the interesting things that, that Deborah says to Barak is, if you want me to go with you, you know a woman is going to get credit for the victory. And we read that and we think, oh, well, Deborah is going to get credit for the victory. It's actually not. It is not Deborah, but another woman. The battle ensues. Sisera loses badly. Barak whoops up on uh, these Canaanites, and Sisera is on the run. And I want you to go down to verse 17 with me. Verse 17, Sisera fled away on foot to the tent of, we call her Jael, Yael, the wife of Heber the Kenite. So this is the woman who's going to be the hero of the story here. And there was peace between Jabin and the king of Hazor in the house of Heber the Kenite. So Sisera thinks, whew, I am in, in alliance territory here. And Jael, this woman, she comes out to meet Sisera and said to him, turn aside, my Lord, turn aside to me. Do not be afraid. So he, he's desperate. And Sisera turned aside to her into the tent and covered, and she covered him with a rug. And, and he said to her, this is Judges 4.19, he said to her, please give me a little water to drink, for I am thirsty. He's He's running for his life here. He, he thinks he's okay now. Well, she doesn't give him water. She opens a skin of milk and gave him a drink and, and covered him. And, and he said to her, stand at the opening of the tent. And if any man comes and asks you, is anyone here? Say no. Okay, now here we go. But Jael, the wife of Heber, a woman, took a tent peg, took a hammer in her hand, she went softly to him and drove the peg into his temple until it went down into the ground while he was lying fast asleep from weariness. <clears throat> so he died. Not a very pretty scene, is it? And that's what unfolds here in verses 17 through, through 22. Uh, Jael deceives her victim. She kills him within the tent so nobody can see what's going on. She uses a rather unusual weapon, doesn't she? And she thrusts her peg into his temple. It even goes down into the ground. And, and Jael kills her victim. Here's one of the beautiful, wonderful intricacies of the book of Judges. And I'm, I'm mentioning this not so you can memorize all this, but there are a number of parallels between what Jael does here in Judges 4, 17 through 22, and what Ehud did in Judges 3, 17 through 30. Ehud deceived his victim, cloak kills Eglon behind closed doors, uses a rather unusual weapon, a, a, at least it's a sword on his left side, I, I, or with his left hand on his right side. He thrusts, it's the same word that's used, he thrusts his sword 
and can't pull it back out, just like with the peg, and Ehud uh, kills Eglon. You see the parallels there? You see how the Bible is, is presenting to us a very carefully crafted book. And, and so the, you, you've got these connections between Jael, who's not a, who's not a judge, but she's the hero of the story. She kills the commander of the Canaanite army. And, and so uh, in chapter five, you have a song celebrating the victory. A woman receives the victory. Chapter six, chapter six is going to tell us about Gideon and time will fail us to speak of Gideon and Jephthah and Samson and all these other fellas. I wish we had more time, but I, I'm going to tell you that the book of uh, Judges chapters six through eight tell us about Gideon. And here is his tragic flaw. His tragic flaw is he is so scared to death. In fact, uh, he is presented as threshing wheat in the wine press when the angel of the Lord appears to him and says, Oh, valiant warrior, mighty man of valor, verse 12. And Gideon is like, huh, what? You talking to me? And uh, he, he is so fearful that he, he constantly says, well, I, I need tests. I need to verify that you are from God. And you're going to see that as you, as you read for yourself, it, you read, uh, all about, about Gideon and how fearful he is. And, and you might be familiar with uh, the, the sign of the fleece. I bet, I bet most of you probably are. Well, he, he is called by God to, to be the judge to deliver them from the Midianites. And before he does this, he has to clear his house. By, he's commanded by God to destroy the altar of Baal. He doesn't do it during the day. He does it at night. You know why? Because he's afraid. He's afraid of what people are going to say. And then he's still afraid. God, are you really with me? Really? And so he puts God through a series of tests with the sign of the fleece. And that's recorded in the end of chapter six. We go into chapter seven. Oops, I'm, I'm behind there. Sorry about that. We go into chapter seven and I'm going quickly here, but, but uh, you have an army. Gideon musters an army of 32,000. Now that sounds good. That sounds like a lot of people. The Midianite army, we find out, has 135,000. They're outnumbered more than four to one. Then God says, well, you know what, Gideon? You're outnumbered four to one, but, but you have too many. Tell everybody who is afraid, all the Israelites who are afraid, to go home. 22,000 walk out on Gideon. I'm going home. I don't, I don't want to be doing this. Now you are outnumbered 13 and a half to one. And God says, it's still too many, Gideon. I don't want anyone saying Gideon's the one who gave victory to Israel by defeating Midian. 300, they whittle them down to 300 men. And of course, it's God who who is going to provide the victory. And yet God says to Gideon, now listen, you're ready to go. You're 300 men against 135,000 Midianite soldiers. You got this, Gideon. I'm with you. But if you need one more test, I'll let you do it. And sure enough, fearful Gideon takes God up on his offer. You can read about the tremendous victory of um, Gideon over the Midianites, and it is nothing short of miraculous. And that's the point. God is the one who calls the victory for Gideon, not Gideon, not his 300 soldiers. God does. But guess what happens? The people, yeah, they give lip service to God, but they're going to end up saying, Gideon, he's our man. If he can't do it, no one can. And they love Gideon. And it goes to Gideon's head. Now he says all the right words. Oh, the Lord shall be your king. The Lord is going to be your leader. And yet, what does he name his son? Abimelech. And you know what Abimelech means? My father is the king. Gideon was fearful, and then he had confidence in himself after his victory. So not going so well. That, that's um, 
the story of Gideon finishes in Judges 8, and then the story about Abimelech, who's not a judge, but tries to appoint, appoint himself as king, ends up getting a bunch of people killed, and, uh, and himself, he finally dies at the end of chapter 9. This is sordid stuff. Uh, in chapter 10, you've got an, an assortment of minor judges that are told. And so you've got uh, Ibzan, Elon, Abdon in Judges 10. Uh, also, the main character is Jephthah, whose story is told in Judges 10 through 12. And then that will bring us to Samson. Now, I want to tell you something. Uh, you remember how we said each time you go through the cycle, it gets worse and worse? Uh, Othniel is great. Ehud, he's got that left hand deal. Deborah's a woman, and then in jail is actually the one who, a woman who defeats the enemy. So that's kind of the bad thing there. Gideon's fearful. Jephthah makes a horrible, horrible vow, ends up sacrificing his own daughter after God had already promised, I'm going to give you victory. And then Samson. Oh boy, I just love to spend a lot of time with Samson on Samson with you. He is a reprobate a womanizer, and it's, it leads to his downfall. You remember, he's the strong man who is defeated because he lets a woman know his secret. If God, uh, if, if his hair is cut, then he will lose his strength. Uh, so there are some connections between Deborah and Samson. There are also connections between Othniel and Gideon that we're not going to get into. And then there are connections between Ehud and Jephthah. There, there are some parallels between their stories. Let me point out some between Deborah and Samson that you might might think, well, really? Look at that. Isn't that something? Uh, Deborah, uh, we're told, um, her uh, during her judgeship, she ruled 20 years. Sisera oppressed them for 20 years. Samson will end up judging Israel for 20 years. Deborah's name means honeybee. In the story of Samson, he finds... Uh, a beehive in the carcass of a lion that he had just killed with his bare hands. <laughs> Jael uh, killed her victim, Sisera, the commander of the Canaanite army. She pretends to like him. You remember that? Oh, yeah, come in here. Let me help you out. But she really hates him. And Delilah, the woman who uh, defeats Samson by getting, her, uh, getting him to tell her her secret, his secret, uh, she she really hates him. She's a Philistine herself, and she hates Samson, although she pretends to love him. In fact, she says to Samson, how can you say you love me when you won't tell me your secret? And he badges her until finally he says, okay, I'll tell you my secret. Will you please stop? They cut his hair. They, he's weak. They pluck out his eyes. You remember all that? If you don't, read the delightful story of, of Je Samson in Judges 13 through 16. Uh, Jael has this unusual weapon. Uh, Delilah uses a weaving pen to um, try to manipulate Samson and find out his secret. Uh, Jael betrays a man who was sleeping. Remember what, what happened to, to Samson? He's sleeping in the lap of Delilah. They cut his hair and then he becomes weak. I have hurried through judges and I hope I've piqued your interest. I hope I've reminded you of some things that are going to help you go back to Judges and, and make more sense of how the book all fits together. Uh, the, the prologue, chapter 1 through chapter 3, verse 6. You've got this cycle of Judges in, chapter, in the remainder of chapters 3 through 16. And then you have an epilogue that starts and stops with everyone did what was evil in his own eyes. They had no regard for God at all. All right, Ruth. Ruth occurs in the days of the Judges, the little book of Ruth. I'm just going to point a couple things out, and then we're going to have to quit tonight. In the days when the judges ruled, that's when the book of Ruth takes place. And Ruth is the title character for the book, okay. But there's two other characters that play prominent roles. And uh, some dare say that they're actually the, the leader, the lead role, the protagonist. But I don't, I don't know. Uh, do not call me Naomi, and her name means sweet. Call me Mara. Uh, this is Naomi after she has lost her husband and her two sons while they were hiding in Moab, uh, trying to get away from a famine. Well, you remember how in the beautiful book of Ruth, 
uh, Ruth refuses to leave her mother-in-law. And, and that's where she says in, in Ruth chapter 1, verse, verses 16 and 17, listen, Naomi, um, uh, your people shall be my people, your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything but death parts me from you. Words often quoted at weddings, even though it's not pertaining to a wedding. But there is a wedding in the book of Ruth. It's a love story. And there is a man who is introduced to us. When Naomi and Ruth go back to Judah, they go back to Bethlehem. And they're living there, but they're poor now. They, they have nothing. Uh, their, Naomi's husband, Elimelech, died. And, and there's no inheritance for her. She's a woman. She, she has nothing. Well, then we start reading about this man, man, Boaz. We're introduced to him in chapter 2, verse 1. And he is called a worthy man. In chapter 3, verse 11, he, in turn, calls Ruth a worthy woman. These are good, godly people. Now, Ruth is a Moabitess. She's a Moabite. She's a Gentile. And yet, she becomes the great-grandmother of King David. Can I tell you some, some points about Boaz and how he parallels Jesus. Now, here's the thing about Boaz. He becomes the great grandfather of David, and then Jesus is a descendant of David. Look look at this. They're both from the tribe of Judah. They both live in Bethlehem, which is in Judah, of course. In the book of Ruth, there's a big emphasis on the role of redeemer. Boaz is a redeemer, and he redeems Naomi so that she can have her her family land and 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 Boaz does this by marrying Ruth. They get married, they have a kid, uh, Obed who has a kid named Jesse, who has a kid named David. And so Ruth not only becomes a progenitor of a of a king of Israel, but she also becomes the ancestor of Jesus Christ our Lord. Uh, something else about Boaz, he, he is always so kind, and he provides food for people. In fact, you read in Judges 2 this beautiful description of, of how he's paying careful attention to this Moabite Ruth. I'm sure she's a beautiful young lady, and he's he's being nice to her. He's a, he's a lot older than she is. And uh, and he he actually instructs some of his young men who are, who are gleaning the grain. It's time for harvest. And he says, let her glean even among the sheaves. Do not reproach her. And then they're supposed to, as they're gleaning the grain, leave some for her so that she'll go back in afterwards and have extra grain. And, and he provides grain in abundance for her. Well, that parallels Jesus, our Lord, who had compassion on people and fed them, not just a little bit of food, a lot of food, as recorded in Matthew 14. So many connections between Boaz and his eventual descendant, Jesus Christ our Lord. Isn't that amazing? I mentioned this last week. We're about to close here. Uh, the books of Joshua, Judges, Samuel, and Kings all go together. Uh, they're a set. Uh, they're often referred to as the former prophets. What, what we've just done over the last two weeks is looked at Joshua very quickly, Judges very quickly, and Joshua began with Israel entering the land, Kings Second Kings chapter 25 ends with him getting kicked out of the land. So this is beginning to end, entering the land, being kicked out of the land. How did that happen? Why did this happen? Joshua, Judges, Samuel, Kings are, are history, yes, but they're also explaining how God's people ultimately forsook God, and yet he still had mercy, and we'll talk more about that. Uh, we, we've gone through Joshua in one session quickly. We've gone through Judges in one session quickly. Let me tell you, First and Second Samuel are actually the longest of these four books. It is, it is the longest. It is epic. And we're going to try to walk through it very quickly next week. And I hope that you will join us. So we walked through Judges tonight, looked at the little book of Ruth for a few minutes as well. I appreciate you tuning in. I hope this is helpful to you. And I uh, ask God to bless you in your continued study as you uh, see the big picture of God's redeeming plan for humanity.
thanks for studying with me tonight. Appreciate it very much.